And now for one of Australia's most distinguished foreign policy figures of the modern era, Peter Varghese is a former head of the Office of National Assessments and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. He's also been a High Commissioner uh, in Malaysia and in India. These days, of course, he is the Chancellor of the University of Queensland. Please welcome Peter Varghese. We will come to questions very soon, but let me start uh, with Peter. Uh, given everything that John Mearsheimer has just said there, uh, the end of US unipolarity since the end of the Cold War, the, the rise of China, uh, the re-emergence of Russia on the global stage, um, the crisis in Ukraine, the crisis of the Middle East. Um, can America really, as you said at our concilium at the Gold Coast uh, this weekend, can it really walk and chew gum at the same time? Uh, well, Tom, firstly, thank you so much for um, inviting me to be here tonight, and it's a great pleasure to um, again listen to John Mearsheimer. I mean, John is not only uh, a very eminent scholar, but probably even more importantly, he is a very brilliant teacher, and you would have seen why in the remarks that he made. Um, the short answer, Tom, is that uh, the United States must have a multiple focus. Uh, it is uh, the global preeminent power. It cannot afford the luxury of only concentrating on one big thing, important though that big thing is. And while John is entirely correct to point out the perils of distraction, uh, and the dangers of quagmires looming in Ukraine, the Middle East, and elsewhere, the reality is that the United States can't go around the world saying in response to these regional conflicts, I want to keep my powder dry because China is the main game. Uh, and the reason it can't do that is not only because that's not what a global power does, but it seems to me that the primary driver of US strategic thinking is the maintenance of its global strategic primacy. And when the US talks about China as its pacing challenge, or when it talks about the China threat, I don't think the threat from China to the United States is an existential threat in the traditional sense of that word. In other words, a threat that the United States would uh, invade the, uh, that China would invade the United States or extinguish the United States as a nation. The threat from China is a threat to US preeminence. And the pacing challenge of China is China's ambition to be the hegemon first of the Indo-Pacific and probably uh, more broadly. Now, there are a lot of reasons why that ambition is not congenial to the United States and indeed is not congenial to Australia. And there are a lot of reasons why we need to think about what is the best way of dealing with that, including constructing a balance of power in the Indo-Pacific, which makes it very difficult for China to achieve that, ex uh, that objective of being uh, the regional hegemon. Um, f you know, from Australia's point of view, China wants to recreate the old Middle Kingdom. And historically, the old Middle Kingdom was a world where hierarchy was harmony, China was at the top of the hierarchy, and every other nation preemptively conceded the primacy of China's interests. That's what China wants to do in the Indo-Pacific and probably what it wants to do more broadly. Um, now, for as long as China remains a one-party authoritarian system, that is, not an attractive proposition for a country like Australia. Uh, it's not that we have a problem with, with a hegemon. Australia has no problem with the concept of a hegemon because as John indicated, we have been huge beneficiaries of the United States as the global hegemon and the United States as the regional hegemon. 
But that was a liberal democracy. That was a country that grew and was grounded in the principles of secular liberal democracy and therefore gave us a level of comfort a level of comfort we will not have uh, with, uh, with China if it were to achieve that objective. So I, I, I think um, inevitably the United States must involve itself in major regional conflicts. The risks are indeed quite high. The prospect of a three front, um, um, whether it's a war or a three front, managing mm. three fronts of conflict uh, is an enormous burden for the United States. To some extent, that burden can be lightened by its alliance network and its alliance links, but ultimately, preeminent powers have to be preeminent in strategy as well as everything else. Peter, you talk about the US exercising global strategic primacy, but isn't it true that two recent presidents, although they express themselves in different ways, President Obama from 09 to 17 and President Trump from 17 to 21, didn't they want to redefine the American role, uh, particularly in the aftermath of the debacles in Iraq and Afghanistan? They wanted to redefine the American role in the world in a way that recognized American limits to power. And at the same time, the United States, as I'm sure you're all aware, is increasingly uh, bogged down in these polarizing domestic disputes in Washington. America is frighteningly polarized at a domestic level. Given all this, doesn't it make sense that Washington would want to reorder its priorities in favor of not just greater discrimination and selectivity, but also in favor of focusing on a peer competitor in China, which Russia and Iran are clearly not? Uh, well, it's, it, it, it certainly makes sense for the United States to try and uh, narrow its focus, but I would argue in the end there's some things that you, that you cannot escape. Um, I don't think the US has um, discarded the aspiration or indeed the retention of strategic primacy, but I think what we are seeing is a re-articulation and to some extent a reconceptualizing of what that primacy looks like. Now, in the, in, in the unipolar moment uh, and for most of the post-war period, the United States primacy was such that the uh, power of the United States was sufficient to basically deal with the aggregate of all threats even though throughout that period the United States had an alliance structure. I think what we're seeing now is the United States essentially coming to the view that in order to retain its primacy, it needs to basically work through an alliance structure. So alliances are no longer useful things to have. Mm. Alliances are necessary things to have for the United States to retain its primacy. Now, you, you could argue that um, that's a, in fact a sublimation of primacy because if you're not able to exert uh, the weight of your power against all comers, you're no longer primary. But I think that is where US strategic thinking is heading and that is essentially what we're seeing unfolding certainly in the Indo-Pacific. Europe's different because they have a much longer history of um, alliances, although the unequal distribution of contributions to that alliance has been, alliances has been, a, has been a continuing issue. Let's get John Mearsheimer's response to Peter Varghese, but in the meantime, I'd encourage all of you to think about good questions to put to both John and Peter. First to you, John. I'll be very quick because I do want to go to the questions. I said this to Peter the other day. We were on a panel on the Gold Coast, and I think Peter represents the conventional wisdom in the United States, right? And, and I think more generally in the West, that the United States has a responsibility to manage every crisis on the planet. Uh, to put it in cruder terms, the United States should stick its nose in everybody's business. And we love doing that, right? Uh, that's what American leadership is all about. I have a fundamentally different view. I'm interested in maintaining American primacy. That means I worry about China, because that's the peer competitor. I don't care about the Russians. 
And if the Russians are foolish enough to start a war in Ukraine and get bogged down in a war in Ukraine, that's their business. It has no effect on the balance of power. And therefore, I don't care very much. But that's not the way most Americans think. And I think it's not the way that Peter thinks. Uh, and it's just important that you understand that I am really cutting against the conventional way of thinking about American foreign policy or American strategy on the planet. We'll go to questions very soon, please. But John, your critics will say that it was Russia that invaded a smaller power in Ukraine, violated international law. First time we've seen an invasion of another nation state since World War II. And the overwhelming consensus in Australia, as well as in Washington, is that we have a moral obligation to support the little guys against the big bullies in Russia. What's wrong with that argument? Well, you're going to end up fighting wars all over the planet. And if you people in Australia and people in the United States want to fight wars all over the planet, be my guest. I mean, I think you should do it because uh, you're enthusiastic about the enterprise. But uh, I happen not to be enthusiastic about the enterprise. The other thing is, if you look at a situation like Ukraine, it's not Australians and Americans who are do doing the dying. I'd be willing to bet if we had to take young people from Australia and the United States States and put them on the front line in uh, Ukraine, uh, that war would end very quickly. But one just final point on this. If we, after the Cold War ended with the Soviet Union, we had left Europe, or just stayed put, and not expanded NATO eastward, we would not have this conflict in Ukraine. We are the principal cause of the war in Ukraine. And I actually believe, not to be unfair to Peter, but I think it's folks thinking like you who believe that the United States has a responsible to manage every nook and cranny of the world that facilitates NATO expansion and leads to these sorts of but problems. But it was Hungary and Poland and the Czech Republic and other Eastern European and Central European powers that wanted the Americans to look after their security. There are all sorts of people who want us to look after their security. There's no question about that. The Australians want us to look after their security. <laughs> I don't blame them one bit. But if a country wants us to look after their security and it doesn't make sense from our point of view, then we shouldn't do it. We should do what's in the American national interest. Peter Varghese. So, so, so John, it's, it's not a question of Australia and other countries wanting the United States to do this. The United States, for as long as it sees itself as the preeminent power of the world, is stuck with doing it. It's, it's handcuffed to doing it. It doesn't have the luxury, <laughs> unless it's willing to give up that objective and that status, of just ignoring it issues around the world. That's because there are more Peter Varghese's in America than there are, <laughs> than there are John Mearsheimer's. <laughs> First question, Drew Pavlo to John Mearsheimer. Beautiful. Uh, today I agree with Peter Varghese. I mean, who'd have thunk it, but... <laughs> Can I quote you, Drew? <laughs> um, my question's for Mearsheimer. In your infamous 2015 University of Chicago lecture... You Which, by the way, has now 30 million views on YouTube. Go on, Drew. Good on you. Uh, you dismissed the idea that Russia would ever try to conquer Ukraine, arguing Putin is much too smart for that. Then, in the lead up to the 2022 invasion, you argued, and I quote you word for word, what the Russians are going to do is crush the Ukrainians. They're going to bring out the big guns, they're going to turn places like Kiev and other cities in Ukraine like into rubble. It will be like Fallujah, Mosul, Grozny. You argued Western intervention would be pointless because Russia would level Ukraine and go nuclear against the West. Then, in an then, in an interview with Chinese Communist Party-controlled media outlet CGTN on February 23rd this year, you said, and again, quoting word for word, conventional wisdom in the West has long been that Vladimir Putin was an imperialist and he was determined to conquer Ukraine and make it part of Greater Russia. There is no evidence to support that, your words. So, first, we were told by you that Russia and Putin will never try to conquer Ukraine. Then you tell us that Russia will crush the Ukrainians. Then, when Russia invades but fails to take Kiev, you argue there is no evidence that Russia ever wanted to conquer Ukraine. And it, indeed, you said that in your speech tonight. You claim that there is no evidence for that. You claim there's no evidence for the fact that Putin is an imperialist, which completely beggars belief. One, Putin claims Ukraine is not a country and has never existed as a country. He openly compares himself to Peter the Great while musing on territorial conquest. 
Here's his quote. What was Peter doing taking back and reinforcing? That's what he did. And, what, and it looks like it fell on us to take back and reinforce as well. Drew, the question. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, no, I, I understand what the question is. I mean, is. I could go on forever. Okay. But, he, he, you know, he just succinctly, yeah. please, your question. Okay. So you've been wrong over and over and over again about Ukraine, blatantly wrong. You hang out with Viktor Orban. You quote crazy, sleazy Russian military bloggers named Big Surge in okay. your writings. You've claimed... The question... Right, and this is the question. This is the question. You've this is, burnt, a, this is burnt, not a question. It's an, no, this is, it's your, this an, is your question, though. But it's an have you burned your credibility? It's an indictment. Why? No, but... Continue but, with the indictment. This is, this is the question. This Continue the question. with the indictment. Why, why should we listen to you when it comes to Ukraine, when you've been wrong over and over and over okay. again? Okay. Jo okay. John Mishana. Well, I'm correct. Order, order, order. Drew, you've had, your say, mate. you've had your say, John Mishama. My argument was that Putin would not try to conquer Ukraine. That means conquering all of the country and making it part of a greater Russia. Right? This is the argument that Putin is an imperialist. He's interested in conquering Ukraine, making it part of Russia. And then he's, when he's done with Ukraine, he's going to conquer other countries. He has not come close to trying to conquer all of Ukraine. When he invaded Ukraine in 2022, they sent 190,000 troops in at the most. There is absolutely no way that 190,000 troops could conquer Ukraine. When the Germans went into Poland in 1939, and remember, the Germans were only trying to conquer the western half of Poland because the Soviets were going to conquer the eastern half of Poland. The Soviets went in, excuse me, the Germans went in, the Wehrmacht went in with 1.5 million troops. 1.5 million troops. Ukraine is a huge piece of real estate, much bigger than Poland, certainly far bigger than Western Poland. And if Putin were interested in conquering all of Ukraine, he would need at least two million. I would argue he would need three million troops. He did not have those kind of force levels. He did not try to conquer Kyiv. The reason he invaded Ukraine was he wanted to force Zelensky to the bargaining table so they could get some sort of agreement on Ukrainian neutrality, Ukraine not being in NATO. And in fact, as many as you remember, in March, the war starts, remember, February 24th, by early March, the Russians and the Ukrainians are negotiating in Istanbul about a peace deal that will end the war. And of course, it all revolves around the subject of NATO expansion. Putin was willing to cut a deal. The evidence is overwhelming. For those of you who have any doubts about this, you can Google an interview that Naftali Bennett, the Israeli prime minister who was deeply involved in these negotiations, can tell you about what Russian thinking was, what Russian capabilities were, and so forth and so on. So he did not try to conquer all of Ukraine. You use the phrase, or I use the phrase, that he was going to crush Ukraine. I said to you in my talk tonight, and I've said on countless occasions, that he said that he would wreck Ukraine. And he is wrecking Ukraine. He's turning it into a dysfunctional rump state. This is the rhetoric I use all the time. He is now going to conquer uh, and annex a number of oblasts. But he was not interested in doing that before the war. What he wanted to do was cut a deal that created a neutral Ukraine. So I don't think that I've been proved wrong on this one. Next question. Yes, sir. I'll keep it very short. short. Um, our Prime Minister is going to visit China, I think, in the next uh, week or so. Um, what should the um, appropriate trade and investment relationship be between Australia and China? Should it be at the moment where we allow effectively almost 100% of Australia, of Chinese manufactured goods to come in duty free? Should we allow the, 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 um, the free range of um, Chinese tech companies, which we don't have the same reciprocal rights for um, in China? Well, what, should, uh, um, what should the relationship be 
um, from a trade investment perspective between Australia and China? Well, without getting into details, I, I think that uh, Australia should go to great lengths to maximize the amount of economic intercourse that it has with China. Uh, and in the one area where I think there's going to have to be a lot of caution and where they're going to have to, where Australia is going to have to coordinate with the United States involves cutting edge technologies. There's no question that the United States wants to slow down Chinese growth in terms of cutting edge technologies. So Australia will have to be careful on that front. But otherwise, I think Australia should and will go to great lengths to maximize economic intercourse. But what you want to understand is that there is nevertheless going to be an intense security competition in the Pacific with the United States and its allies, which of course includes Australia on one side and the Chinese and their allies on the other side. So you are going to live in the world in the years ahead where there is an intense security competition involving China and where there is at the same time going to be a great deal of economic cooperation involving China. And this is analogous to the situation that existed in Europe before World War I. Very important to understand that there was a huge amount of economic intercourse in Europe before World War I, before, or between or among all the players. At the same time, there was an intense security competition involving the Triple Entente and the Triple Alliance. And of course, because security concerns always trump prosperity concerns, or in, to put it in slightly different terms, security terms always, security competition always trumps economic competition, you got World War I. Peter Varghese, John Mearsheimer supports a policy of containment against China. You have talked about a policy of constrainment and engagement. What's the Albanese government thinking? Well, I think um, the government's position is closer to engaging and constraining than it is to containing. Um, and part of the reason actually goes to the question that was just asked. I mean, the headline objective from an Australian perspective with China is to maximise our economic opportunity and minimise our strategic risk. So that means you try and have as open a trade and investment relationship but with very high fences built around issues that go to national security. Um, and I think that's essentially the framework that we are operating within. The constraining part involves a longer term project of constructing a strategic balance in the region which favours our interests uh, and which puts constraints on China's ability to realize its uh, ambition to be the hegemon of the, of, of the region. And the building blocks of that constraining uh, strategic mechanism are groups like the Quad, hmm. AUKUS, um, and playing on the fact that China's ambition for preeminence is going to have a certain natural resistance built into it because serious countries, apart from the United States, such as India and Japan, naturally find themselves on the other side of the China balance. They each have their own reason for wanting that, but it's a natural and, and, and deep-seated um, view on their part. Um, so. I think over time we will see such a mechanism uh, being established. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it'll take us quite some time before we get there. I mean, at the moment we, we're in the, in the period between a tipping point and a settling point. So the tipping point is, is, is the end of the old post-Second World War order, as John said, the rules-based international order is, is, is gone and it's not coming back. But we haven't yet, I think, worked out what the settling point will be. And my view is that the settling point will, by and large, uh, be built around both engaging China, because China's not going to go away. I mean, we can't close our eyes and wish China away. We have to deal with it. Uh, and from an Australian point of view, uh, the economic dimension of that relationship will continue to be, uh, to be important. But 
we can no longer live in a world of hope for the best engagement with China. Mm -hmm. I mean, that world's gone okay. as well. And there's always a prospect, of course, of China being very consumed with internal affairs. Next question, David. Uh, thank you. Well, first of all, John, please take back to Washington that we Australians do appreciate the United States guaranteeing our protection. Uh, we have ever since the Second World War and the loss of Great Britain to do so, uh, and we certainly don't have the military capability to do so ourselves. Um, but my question to you is, when uh, Putin invaded the Ukraine, a lot of people said that uh, Xi was very happy to enter into an unlimited alliance, so to speak, with Russia on the basis that that distraction would give him the opportunity to move on Taiwan. Now, maybe things didn't go quite as well as the Russians hoped, and it's been bogged down. But ultimately, we know that China wants Taiwan back. Mainland China wants Taiwan back, and that is the greatest threat. You've now raised a second distraction for the United States, um, which will divert it from focus here in this region in East Asia. So my question to you is strategically, when do you think China will make a move on Taiwan, given Taiwan cannot possibly defend itself on numbers or on material against China if it so chooses to do so? John Mishama. Yeah, I don't think that China will move on Taiwan except in one special circumstance. Uh, the reason I'm optimistic that China won't move on Taiwan is that I think the costs and the likelihood of success uh, from a Chinese perspective are remarkably low. Uh, to conquer Taiwan, the Chinese have to launch an amphibious assault across the Taiwan Strait. Amphibious operations are among the most difficult military operations uh, imaginable. Uh, to launch a major league amphibious assault on the Taiwan beaches would be extremely difficult under the best of circumstances, as the Americans learned in World War II with their long experience with amphibious operations. Furthermore, the Chinese military has not fought a war since 1979. So this is not a battle-tested, battle-hardened military. This is a military that's inexperienced, that really has not much combat experience, which is going to set out to try to conquer Taiwan uh, via an amphibious assault. Very difficult. Furthermore, the Americans will be there. I believe the Americans and the Japanese will be there for sure, and I even believe the Australians will be involved. I'm not exactly sure how they will be, but the Americans and the Japanese will be involved along with the Taiwanese who we are in the process of arming. So the likelihood of military success at some reasonable cost for China is remarkably low. The one caveat is the Chinese have made it clear that if Taiwan declares its independence, they will go to war no matter what. That is a red line for them. So you can rest assured the United States is putting enormous pressure on Taiwan to make sure it does not declare its independence. And as long as Taiwan does not declare its independence, and I don't think it will, I underline the word think, I don't think it will, Given the military calculations here, I don't think that the Chinese will invade Taiwan. Next question, Owen. Uh, thanks, Tom, for giving me a chance <coughs> as a long member of CIS based in Brisbane. Um, uh, John and Peter, I want to bring your attention to the down under. Um, uh, given like uh, recently the Beijing held the uh, um, Belt and Road Initiative Forum, um, one of the successful story there is the uh, high speed rail in Indonesia, the Wush. Uh, my question is that what's, what do you think a industrialized and modernized Indonesia mean for Down Under? Uh, my question to Peter is that what's our response? That will uh, Uncle Sam uh, have some solution for us if in the future uh, we have potential um, conflict with in Indonesia? Thank you. Uh, Peter, do you want to go there first? Or? Yeah. Yep. Peter, so Peter Vargas. So, so I, I think um, building a um, strong partnership with Indonesia is vital for our security uh, and indeed is going to be also important in the longer term to uh, economic prosperity. I mean, in Indonesia will probably be in the top five or six economies over the next couple of decades. Um, Australia needs to understand that 
contrary to the popular imagination in Australia, which is that uh, Indonesia is a country run by a mob of generals who have got strategic designs uh, on Australia, that is very far from the truth. Um, so I don't think um, uh, we should proceed on the assumption that we are going to face uh, an antagonistic Indonesia, and I think we should proceed on the assumption that we want to build as close a relationship with Indonesia so that the question of uh, an antagonistic approach simply doesn't arise. On the broader question of um, America coming to Australia's assistance, and it was raised um, by, by the previous question, um, I've um, long held the view that we should um, stick close to uh, the defence of Australia doctrine, which has really been a feature of our strategic thinking from the late 70s onwards. And that basically says that we should utilise and harness the advantages of our close strategic alliance with the United States, but that our ultimate objective should be to develop the capability for Australia to defend this continent without the combat assistance of the United States. And I think we depart from that objective um, to our peril. So maybe unlike David's uh, assumption, uh, I, I do believe that Australia can develop the wherewithal effectively to defend ourselves, short of obviously a, a, a nuclear attack, um, and that we ought to be having much more confidence in our ability to do that, because ultimately um, a country that cannot defend itself uh, does not have true sovereignty. Uh, and given our economic size, and given our strategic location, and given our strategic geography, with distance being uh, a real advantage for Australia. Tyranny of distance, as Geoffrey Blaney put it. Yeah, but, yeah. It's, a, it, but it's an advantage mm -hmm. when it comes to Okay, that. next question over here, and then we'll go over here, sec. Um, hi, panel. Um, a question for both Peter and John. Um, as recently as 2021, um, it seemed that the number one um, global conflict um, emerging beyond our shores was the um, Taliban reclaiming of Afghanistan. And it seems like it's completely gone um, beyond the wayside now. I understand, um, so to speak, we have bigger fish to fry. But is it the case that we've just abandoned Afghanistan um, in, in this instance? And is that the right move? John. It is the case we have abandoned Afghanistan, and if we had been smart, we never would have gone in there in the beginning, and once we went in there, we would have gotten out of there quickly. And the fact that it took us 20 years to get out is because most Americans, like or Westerners like Peter, believe that we should manage the world, and <laughs> many people of Peter's persuasion believe we should still be there. Uh, in fact, uh, if you know, we had had our way back in uh, the 1970s when Vietnam was collapsing uh, and listened to the people in Washington who were running the government at the time, we'd still be in Vietnam. Uh, and I think, you know, we ought to stay out of these places. Yeah, well, I, mean, I was going to say back in August of 2021, the overwhelming conventional wisdom in the Australian media, the American media, the British media, much of the Western world was that the Biden administration's decision to withdraw from Afghanistan was a strategic disaster. Yes, but that's because most people think like Peter. That the United <laughs> States should manage the world. We should get involved in every conflict and not leave until okay, those conflicts let's are Let's Peter respond I, and then we'll I, go over here. I yep. think I'm being verbaled here. I, I, uh, <laughs> I actually uh, don't think the United States should have stayed on in Afghanistan in, uh, you know, for, a, for a long period of time. I mean, the reality is that the weight of US interests in Afghanistan didn't require it to maintain the strategic presence that it, that it did. And Afghanistan is one of the many lessons of an overreaction in the light of 9-11. Uh, and one of the mistaken assumptions, and this is evident as much in Iraq as it was in Afghanistan, is that in order to deal with a terrorism threat, you have to remake a country, and that the United States should be the one doing the remaking. Now, much, much as I have argued the case for, you, for, for American responsibility for a whole lot of things, mm -hmm. I think it is fundamentally mistaken uh, to go down the path of remaking a country in pursuit of a counter-terrorism objective. Next question. 
at a talk you did a couple of years ago in, in Sydney, I think you mentioned that great powers will make Australia choose between one side or the other. Um, have you moderated your opinion a bit on that? And if, mm. if you were put in the position of negotiating an exit from the Ukraine war, which obviously you, you advocate for, and, the current, and de-escalating the current Israeli-Palestine conflict, um, how, how would you go about talking to the other players that are, are a part of getting a, a political solution to ending that conflict? I think with regard to Australia, uh, as I said uh, back in 2019, they would opt in the end to ally with the United States. Uh, in 2019, it didn't look like China was that serious a threat. People were beginning to see China as a threat in 2019, but it's not the same as 2023. And uh, I think a lot of people thought that Australia had real flexibility. You didn't, because security always trumps prosperity, and you would go with Uncle Sam. I would just add, uh, to the question that was asked over here. Australians don't have to worry about the United States abandoning them because it's in our interest to protect Australia, right? We don't do it because we're benevolent. We believe it's in our interest <laughs> and we will be there for you. This gets back to the 2019 debate with you, White. At you, CIS and yeah, in front of 550 people, come. Yep. Yeah, uh, at that debate, you, uh, who I respect enormously, mm -hmm. nevertheless believed that the United States would not be there mm. for Australia. I think this is just unthinkable. It's like people who argue we won't be there for Taiwan. We yes, but then again, there. there are people like uh, Robert Gates, who served as Defence Secretary under Presidents Obama and Bush, who has said that the greatest national security threat to the United States is not China or Russia or Iran or Sunni jihadists. The greatest national security threat is the two square miles between the White House and the Capitol building on Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue. <laughs> that, that may be true, <laughs> but when you look at the external world, which does matter to the United States, then there's no question. Okay. Next question, yes sir. Thank you very much. Um, I'd be interested in Peter's response on this, but also obviously interested in what John would have to say. Uh, Peter being um, in the architect of the India economic strategy, um, I have a question about uh, where do you think Australia stands in a relation to India with the added complexity of the current issues um, in Canada, the issues between Canada and India, um, and especially with um, how the politics in India in particular is changing, um, especially in the uh, treatment of minorities, including Muslim Sikhs. Mm. Um, and so just generally interested in your thoughts. Good question. Peter Varghese. Yeah, so I mean, I'm um, someone who thinks the Australia-India relationship uh, is important and is going to get even more important for a range of economic and strategic reasons. Um, but um, I, do, I do watch with some concern the way in which uh, the secular, liberal, democratic character of India uh, is being challenged, um, not destroyed, but being challenged by uh, the policies that are currently being pursued. Um, one of the reasons why India is such an attractive partner for Australia is precisely because it has a secular, liberal, democratic character. And anything that erodes that character, in my view, uh, makes India as a strategic and even an economic partner, because as you know, the former governor of the Reserve Bank of India has argued, there is uh, enormous economic benefits to India's um, character in that regard. So we need to be realistic about what we can and can't expect from India. Uh, in, in India is wedded to strategic autonomy. Uh, in many ways, well, in, India professes already a multi-aligned foreign policy. It sees itself as becoming a leading nation and a pole in its own right in a multipolar world. So anyone who thinks that India is going to enter into an alliance-type relationship with the likes of 
Australia or the United States or Japan, I think will end up being disappointed. Um, India is very much focused on its, uh, its own interests and it is absolutely focused on keeping as much strategic room for maneuver open to it as it possibly can. We are quickly running out of time. We've got time for at least two more questions. Yes, sir. Why do we want to be focusing on American hegemony in any way? Why do we want to be turning continually towards American leadership? Is that the best way of achieving goals towards safety of people, economic development, and harmony? And I'm wondering, at what point do we focus on um, other agendas other than American hegemony. And given the dramas and the debacles in Vietnam and Absolutely. Afghanistan and Iraq, does he have a fair point, John Mishama? <clears throat> well, I think that American primacy matters uh, because the survival of the United States is the most important goal that it can have. In fact, the survival of any state is the most important goal that state can have. And the best way to survive in the international system is to be the most powerful state on the planet. Because if you're really powerful, nobody can beat you in a fight and threaten your survival. The Chinese understand this very well. The Chinese understand that they, when they were weak, what happened to them is that the great powers in the system preyed upon China. They call it the century of national humiliation. The Chinese have no intention of ever becoming weak again if they can help it. They want to be powerful. They want to dominate Asia the way we dominate the Western Hemisphere. And I don't blame them one bit. Because if you're not powerful in the international system, you suffer the century of national humiliation. Now, what exactly does it mean in the American case? What it means is we want to be a regional hegemon in the Western Hemisphere. We want to be the only great power in the Western Hemisphere and dominate it. And number two, we want to make sure there is no other country on the planet that dominates its region of the world the way we do. And if you can take care of those two goals, then you're in excellent shape. That's why I focus on China, and that's why I want to prevent China from dominating Asia. All the other things you talk about, I care about somewhat, but I principally care about the United States being extremely powerful because, again, that's the best way to survive. Next question at the back there. Um, thanks so much for tonight's event. It's been fantastic. I just wanted to get your perspective, John. You talk so much about population numbers and things like that, and, Peter, this will be for you as well. How does India start to change the balance of power? It's population is projected to be larger than China, its economic growth is, you know, strong. How will that change, you know, you spoke about that order, United States, China, Russia. Yeah. How does India begin to change that? And then if Asia is the primary focus, how does India's emergence change that balance of power in that area? Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Yeah. The, the two principal tap roots of power are population size and wealth. And if you look at China, China has always had a huge population size. But we did not consider China a great power during the Cold War. Remember, it was a bipolar system, the United States and the Soviet Union, not China. We did not consider China a great power during the unipolar moment. There was only one great power, the United States. We now consider China a great power. What happened? The population size remained basically constant, what changed was China became wealthy. This gets back to the question about Indonesia. Indonesia is not a wealthy country the way that China is today or the way that the United States is. If Indonesia all of a sudden turns into uh, a new China and it gets very wealthy, you Australians will worry greatly about <laughs> Indonesia because according to my calculations, there are about 10 Indonesians for every oh, Australian, no, more, I think. if not more, yeah. and they're right next door, <laughs> but they're not wealthy, and that's good for you, right? <laughs> and that's why it was good for us when China was not wealthy, but we helped make it wealthy. And this gets back to India, just very quickly. India is not wealthy enough to, to, to qualify as a great power. If it does get wealthy with that population size, 
Oh boy, it'll probably be the most powerful state on the planet. Peter Varghese, then the last question. Yeah, look, I, I think India will only shift the balance of power in Asia uh, when it acquires real economic heft. So China is five times the size of the Indian economy, um, and it'll be some time before India has that uh, economic weight. Um, so I think, I think we need to be a bit careful when we talk about a multipolar world because for the foreseeable future I think the world we're going to live in is essentially a bipolar world with a multipolar periphery. Um, unlike John, I don't see Russia as, uh, as big a strategic player, econo an economic player. I mean, Russia uh, certainly has the power of nuclear weapons, its economy is relatively small and getting smaller probably by all accounts. Russia is not a strategic shaper, Russia is a strategic spoiler. Um, and I, I think if we do end up with a third poll in the longer term, there are other candidates who would have much better credentials than Russia. Okay, final question. Uh, my question is for Professor Mirshama. Is there room for expansion in AUKUS like there was with NATO in Europe? And or will we see NATO come to Asia? Yeah, very good question. Uh, if you think about the alliance structure we had in Europe during the Cold War, which was, of course, centered around NATO. NATO was what really mattered. We didn't have bilateral alliances in Europe. We had one alliance that really mattered, which was NATO. And the reason you could do that was because the threat from the Soviet Union was concentrated in Central Europe. And you had all these European countries and the United States and Britain that concentrated their forces on the central front. So you had the French, the Germans, the Belgiques, the Dutch, uh, and so forth and so on, the Americans that formed this actually quite cohesive alliance to deal with this threat centered in the heart of Europe. If you look at the problem that the, American f the Americans face today, putting together an alliance structure in Asia. It's a very difficult situation because the threats come in distant places like the East China Sea, the South China Sea, Taiwan. You're talking about putting together an alliance structure that includes India and Japan and Australia and the United States. That's the quad. They're spread out all over God's little green acre, right? Really very different than NATO. So what the alliance structure in Asia looks like today bears no resemblance to NATO. It's a series of bilateral alliances that form the foundation. This is the US-Japan relationship or alliance, the US-South Korea, the US-Philippines, the US-Australia alliance. You have these bilateral alliances and then superimposed on them are not terribly powerful alliances like AUKUS and the Quad. These are the multilateral alliances. Are they helpful? Yes. Am I glad we have them? Yes. But are they going to save the day the way NATO did in Europe during the Cold War? Absolutely not. What you really need are those bilateral alliances with the multilateral ones multilateral alliances on top of them. This is the third trip that John Mearsheimer has made to Australia. When I was at the University of Sydney in 2010, we brought him uh, to Sydney to give a keynote address on why China's rise would not be peaceful. And then in 2019, we at CIS invited John to come to, ca come to Australia to do a series of events, including a debate against Hugh White in, in Canberra in front of 550 people. And on my Radio National program, you debated uh, the former Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd. And now, 2023, John's been a guest at CIS, both at the Gold Coast last weekend uh, and here in Brisbane. Uh, it's great to have you back, John. Thank you so much. I also want to pay tribute to Peter Varghese, an ornament to public service in this country and to foreign affairs. Please join me in thanking John Mearsheimer and Peter Varghese.